Thank you for the welcome. I hate to respond to it with bad news, but just half an hour ago, I discovered that uh, uh, what I thought uh, was on my uh, USB, uh, the PowerPoint presentation for this lecture with all the paintings illustrated on it, is uh, not on it, in fact. Somehow I put the icon for my PowerPoint lecture on my USB, but the content did not go on. So all I've got is a few photos. Fortunately, the photo of the uh, Louis Saw mural itself is here, okay, but none of the photos of the Goryeo uh, dynasty uh, painting that I wanted to show you is here, and I'm very sorry about that because I went to a lot of trouble to, uh, to get them. However, I'll do my best to describe what those paintings are like uh, ad living in the course of my lecture. Fortunately, I've got a paper copy and it's here so I can actually speak uh, to you tonight. To begin, Ganjin County is shaped like an upside down V uh, around an inlet called Ganjin Man on the southwest coast of Korea in Jalanamdo very remote place, but it's known for its celadon industry, which dates back to the Goryeo dynasty, and is still celebrated in an annual uh, festival. I even think the RASKD might organize uh, a celadon festival tour down there sometime, because there's a very big celadon museum and celadon works in uh, Ganjingu uh, today. But what interests us tonight is a temple called Mugwisa, about 15 kilometers northwest of Gan Ganjin Uk, the county seat, which is at the northern tip of Ganjin Man. In Mugwisa, the Hall of Ultimate Bliss, or Gumnakjong, contains national treasure number 301. Now, it's number 301 according to Wikipedia, but according to another source that I recently saw, it's 313. And I was just speaking to a gentleman who's an RSKB member here who's told me that it's not in the 300s at all. Anyway, this mural is a national treasure, whatever number uh, it is. Its full title in English is the Amitabha Tathagata Buddha Triad Mural. In Korean, Amitabha Ryore Bul Samjong Gyakwa. Estimated to have been painted in 1476 during the early Joseon, that is, and attributed to the great Son master painter, Heiryo. Whatever the exact year of its execution, the movie Son mural is clearly early Joseon, as can be seen by similarities and differences with Buddhist painting of the previous Goryeo dynasty from 938 to 1390. Its combination of continuity and change relates to the development of Korean Buddhism in general. Now, I was going to be showing you slides all through this in the corner of the margin. I've got slide two, slide three, slide four, but I'll have to skip that. It must be understood at the outset that all Korean, that all Buddhist art contains a philosophical message. It usually depicts Buddha in a pose of teaching or meditation, thus leading the viewer to fulfill his or her potential. Paintings in particular convey Buddhist themes and principles and are judged by how well they do this rather than artistic skill or innovation. They are nonetheless used for decoration as well as creating solemnity and aiding worship. Ultimately, their beauty and their meaning combine to help the viewer on his or her spiritual path. All of these factors must be borne in mind while assessing the movie Saw Mural, which is the classic example of Buddhist painting for any era. Now, here is figure one, the uh, movie Saw the Girl Mural itself. You can quickly see its major features. Uh, the main figures are facing the viewer very directly. It has this overall simple but dignified composition and perspective, you can see, leading back to heaven uh, from which 
the main figures have clearly come down. They're surrounded by clouds. And you can see Buddha's disciples coming out of the clouds in mid-ground. They all have, the main figures all have black halos against the general yellowish-orange color. Did anyone else notice anything about it? Anything I missed? I'll throw the open. Okay, you can have a, have a have more discussion about it during Q&A. Okay. It's clearly an object of contemplation and prayer. It's meant to be looked at and prayed to. To find out how much this painting comes from past tradition and how much innovation, we need to examine paintings from the Gorya. As is well known, uh, the Gorya was the only dynasty in Korean history to adopt Buddhism as a state religion, resulting in the construction of many temples and the production of much art. Of the latter, most extant paintings are from the late 14th century, but they represent the classic aesthetic of the whole period. There are fewer than 160, of which some 120 are in Japan. Estimates actually vary. The first book about them was, in fact, in Japanese. It is certain that most of them, nearly all of them, uh, are in, Gorya paintings are in Japan. They were taken during Imjin Weira. The most popular Buddhist cult of the Gorya was Pure Land Buddhism, Jongto in Korean, which means the worship of Amitabha, the Buddha who rules over the Western paradise. Of all the Gorya paintings that survived, over half show him in the center. He was also venerated by the Japanese, which is why they stole so many Gorya paintings in the 1590s. By the time of the Gorya, Buddhism had been Koreanized enough to no longer be an import, and it was widely supported, not only among the common people, but also among the royalty and nobility who gave it privilege and patronage. Finally, it was during the Gorya that Sun known as Zen, more, more commonly in the West, uh, became the standard form of a religion in Korea. It still is today. All these factors culminated in an outpouring of art dedicated to Amitabha, which is why the surviving paintings we have today uh, mainly show him in the center, mainly the, the dominant figure in them. What were the characteristics of Gorya painting? For one thing, uh, the royal and aristocratic patrons who commissioned it already knew Buddhist teaching so that it had what the art historian uh, Chung Wu Tet called, quote, a strong sense of conceptual quality. As for technical expertise, another scholar, Yukio Lippet, notes, uh, quote, a sophisticated representation of garment textures, meticulous attention to surface patterns, and abundance of pure land subjects, in quote, with a special emphasis on the bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas accompanying Amitabha, although he is so the dominant figure. And the primary colors of red, dark green, and dark blue are the main color scheme of most of them, which make them distinct from uh, contemporary paintings in China and Japan. These colors were unmixed with other pigments and layers, which keeps them bright today. <coughs> and in, here in Seoul, you can go to the Leon Samsung uh, Art Gallery in Itaewon, or the National Museum of Korea in Yong San Gu, um, and see uh, examples of them. Uh, they're, 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 still, they're still quite bright. Goryeo artists also applied heavy amounts of gold leaf in which they were skilled to their paintings to give them life, and in all the uh, Amitabha triad paintings, uh, Amitabha wears a red robe with gold leaf medallion pattern on it, which you can kind of see here, although not quite the same. <coughs> uh, Lippet, for his part, points out that the warm red and cool blue and green balanced each other, as well as noting that there are, quote, disparities in scale between the main icons and accompanying figures, and minimal emphasis on landscape or illusionistic space. That's a major point I want to make and I wish I had my PowerPoint slides because I could show you some Goryeo examples. There, they have very much black backgrounds or dark backgrounds. There's not much depth perception in them. Okay, and the major difference, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but the major difference between this Joseon mural is that there is depth perception in it, 
from earth, where the main, main figures are, all the way back to heaven, from which they've come down. Okay. Also, in uh, Goryal paintings, Amitabha is usually so seated on a lotus throne, and the bodhisattvas uh, have their heads at his knee level or below. In this one, they're higher, but I'll be getting on to that uh, later. Goryal paintings were also small, usually only about one meter high, and intended for private, meditational, or devotional use in home shrines rather than temples. It's noticeable, it's a notable that the phrase, quote, for these merits, I hope myself and others to be reborn in paradise, end quote, appears on many Abhitabha paintings, starting with the Gorya dynasty, but continuing straight through to the end of the Joseon, which would have been a little over a hundred years ago, so it continues until quite recently, despite the fact that the Joseon dynasty generally repressed Buddhism. This is the point I'll return to later. One common depiction of Amitabha and the Bodhisattvas Avalokitesvara, known as Vlanam in Korea, and Mahasava Prapta, known as Deiseji in Korea, was that, was that in which the three are shown welcoming a, a departed soul to the Western paradise. This genre is known as the welcoming descent, Neyongdo in Korean, a kind of Amitabha triad, Amita Sanjongbu, that appears apparently only in painting, although Amitabha triads can also be found in sculpture. In fact, the movie saw mural has an Amitabha triad sculpture right in front of it on the altar, and I'll show you a picture I took myself later. Louis saw is also typical in having its welcoming descent mural and sculpture in its ultimate bliss hall, Gumatran, which can be called, also be called the Paradise Hall or Amitabha Hall, since he's the Buddha to whom it's dedicated. And he and the two bodhisattvas greet believers after death and guide them to the Western Paradise. And that's the traditional, the welcoming descent is the traditional uh, Gorya tradition from which this painting is derived, you know, although it's updated in a lot of ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Now, an important painting is the Cleveland Museum of Art on the, on the Chava Triad from the later 14th century. There's also one at the Hoan Art Museum in Yongin, one of a few such paintings left in its, in its homeland. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get the Hoan one, but it doesn't matter anyway, since uh, again, I don't have my, my PowerPoint uh, with me. Okay. In the Cleveland painting, there's a lack of background. There's just a black background, the three figures against the background, uh, just an opaque against an opaque halo. They're also in three quarters profile, as though they're walking away out of the edge of the picture, okay, with Amitabha reaching out his hand. Okay. And in uh, an early 14th century Amitabha Buddha uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, uh, we have uh, Guanam, or Avalokitesvara, and Deiseji Mahasama Prapta, on other side of Amitabha, who's, as usual, wearing his red robe with gold medallions. Okay. In, in the uh, Met Amitabha, the uh, uh, Amitabha is facing the viewer on a lotus throne, and the two bodhisattvas are turned toward each other in three quarters profile toward the viewer as though they're attending on, on Amitabha, but also aware of the viewer. And we can, it has the, the figures have a uh, dark, back, dark background with opaque goldish black halos around all of them, and a little illusion of depth, which is a typical of Goryeo paintings that have been noted. Okay. Now that we've discussed several slides of Gorya uh, Amitabha, several examples of Gorya Amitabha triads, we should go over exactly who is in them and what they stand for. First of all, there is Amitabha Buddha himself. He's an immortal Buddha with limitless, limitless compassion who rules over the pure land, Jongto, in the western paradise, a part of Nirvana 
and is the main deity of the Pure Land School, which was dominant during the Gorya. <coughs> because Amitabha is so compassionate, all believers have to do to attain rebirth in his paradise after death is recite the words Namu Amitabhu on their deathbed, meaning homage to Amitabha or taking refuge in Amitabha. These words recall the ones on Amitabha paintings mentioned earlier, and I'll return to this point at the end uh, too. Invoking Amitabha's name, though, uh, and regarding an image of him, was a Gorya tradition that was very important for believers who wished uh, to uh, uh, be reborn in the Western paradise after they died. Amitabha is usually depicted in the company of two bodhisattvas, or bodhisattvas in Korean. In the original Sanskrit, bodhi means enlightenment, while sattva denotes the living being. Bodhisattvas are therefore people here on earth who have attained a state as close to Buddhahood as possible without going on to nirvana. However, they are determined to remain on this plane to help others achieve enlightenment. They thus altruistically delay passing on to paradise to relieve the sufferings of others and are considered exemplars of Buddhist precepts. Uh, today, the term is used to denote anyone who is intent on achieving Buddhahood. Always by Amitabha's left side is Avalokitesvara, or Guanam. Uh, her name in Sanskrit means perceiver of the world sound, i.e. suffering. And she's here in this picture. He, she, um, he is known formally in Korea as Guan Seguim, commonly as Guanam, and he's called the Bodhisattva of Compassion. This is because he embodies compassion on Amitabha's behalf, and is also seen as the incarnation of Amitabha's virtue, thus making him most likely assisted for Amitabha. Today he's perhaps the most popular divine figure in Korean Buddhism, but because compassion was traditionally estimated as a feminine virtue in Korea, this body thought that it's frequently depicted as a woman, which is the case in the movie Saw Mural. Can you spot Guanam in this? She's on Amitabha's left side. She's got long hair down to her waist, in fact, and a feminine headdress, and the, the paintings uh, faded and uh, decayed a little bit, but you can still see basically feminine facial features and the kind of uh, pinkish robe so, Guanam is clearly a she in the movie Saw Mural, no matter what she started out as in India. Amitama's right hand assistant is usually Mahasama Prapta, the body, Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Known as Deiseji in Korean, his Sanskrit name means arrival of great strength because he represents the power of wisdom. Interestingly, in Chinese Buddhism, He's frequently portrayed as a woman similar to Avalokitesvara, uh, which uh, is notable because he's male in Korea. He's not in this mural. He's in most of the Gorya dynasty mural. The last of Amitabha's companions, the one in this uh, mural, is Siddhigarbha, who appears in some triads. His, with a name meaning earth treasury in Sanskrit, he is one of four Vaisapas deputed by Sakyamuni, the historic Buddha, to save all souls from this world of suffering before the future Buddha, Maitreya, or Miruk in Korea, comes. Thus, Jijong, as he's known here, vowed to rescue all souls from hell before coming to paradise. He's been an object of folk belief uh, in this country for a long time. He's always male, and you can recognize him because he's got a staff. You can see here, his staff. That's for prying open the gates of hell. And then his other hand, he's got a luminous jewel. When he enters hell, he uh, illuminates the darkness and attracts the souls of damned people to him so that he can rescue them and guide them to paradise. So you can always recognize uh, uh, Jijon by his staff and jewel. If you're ever in a Buddhist temple. To return to the historical context of Gorya Amitabha paintings, I must emphasize again the preoccupation 
of the period with attaining the afterlife. As Jun Helen Michael Shin, evidently the only English language scholar to have written on the subject, points out, both clergy and laymen of the late Gorya dynasty were consumed by the idea of transition to the Western paradox. Moreover, late Gorya people believed they lived in what they called, quote, the age of degenerate Buddhist law when the world was descending into immorality and they could achieve rebirth in the Western paradise by invoking Amitabha's name, especially on their deathbed. <clears throat> Significantly, Shin documents a late Gorya, early Joseon monk named Gihua, who lived around 1400, describing the death of another monk who, while dying, held a banner with Amitabha's image and invoked his name devoutly in order to be uh, reborn in the Western paradise when he died. Shin furthermore documents the Gorya religious atmosphere in which many people long to encounter Buddha via images so that the contemplation of sacred images was a common practice for Amitabha worshippers. Uh, Shin even argues that the minute detail in Gorya paintings was intended to imprint itself on the worshippers' memory, e.g. the pattern on Amitabha's uh, red robe. Uh, I would argue that all these points are obviously applicable to understanding the movie mural, a little background to the movie mural, movie song mural. In an early, earlier article, in fact, Shin argues that the welcoming descent scroll at the Cleveland Museum of Art is an example of a painting brought by a cleric to the bedside of a dying Pure Land believer, which would have been a standard practice at the time. Shin argues that in cases where the figures are depicted frontally and there is no dying figure in the foreground, the dying believer is thus intended to be the viewer. Thus, quote, the picture turns into his visionary experience of transition into the Western par paradox, end quote. By contrast, the three-quarter stamps welcoming descents like Cleveland's and Hoam's are, quote, nothing more than visualized narratives, well, end quote, Hence, there is no involvement of the viewer. Shin elaborates on an earlier theory that the three-quarters profile uh, triad indicates the triad as moving toward a believer <coughs> who is imagined by the viewer outside the frame. And that's uh, significant because uh, back in 2012, not that long ago, another uh, 14th century uh, Amitabha triad was this Amitabha portrait alone was discovered in uh, the Museo Orientale in Rome, Italy. <clears throat> and it shows Anitaba alone in the Swansau Triad, alone, standing in three-quarters profile, reaching his hand out to the edge of the painting as though he's welcoming uh, a, a departed soul to his, uh, his paradise. So there is something of a tradition for the point that Shin makes, although he does not cite that painting. His article was before the discovery of that painting. Like Lippitt, who emphasizes that there is no illusionistic space in this genre, Shin asserts that, quote, since the background and ground plane have been left blank, there is nothing to provide a narrative context, and, that there, and even that there are no motifs that would identify in a specific context. But here, I disagree with Shin, since, as Chong Mei Tech points out, viewers already knew the stories behind the paintings, so they didn't need to have a narrative context explain to them. And I would argue that in the case of the movie saw mural, the narrative context would have been the worshippers' own life and death and other things that I'll be discussing, discussing later. However, despite that, my disagreement with Shin there, he makes the, the significant points that have a make significant points that have a bearing on the movie saw mural. Basically that the frontal depictions would have had a stronger psychological impact than the three-quarter profile ones on the viewer, and that, but that both would have served for deathbed rituals and what he calls, quote, ritual-oriented meditation. Even more pointedly, Shin suggests the lack of iconographic motifs in them means they represent a descent of the deities into our realm that is coming down from heaven to earth, which is pretty clearly what's happening in the movie mural. 
the assert that the Cleveland welcoming dissent and by implication the others was used in by Clarence and Death Rites for Dying Believers. He concludes significantly, quote, the viewer takes the place of the dying believer and, quote, the picture turns into the viewer's visionary experience of transmission of the Western paradox. Put more simply, meditating on a frontal image of a welcoming descent would have helped worshippers envision what they thought they would see after they died. Therefore, she is most on target when he asserts that early Joseon paintings depicted the moment when Amitabha devotees achieved rebirth in the Western paradise, and that late, the late Gorya abandoned three-quarter Amitabha triad for frontal ones, which became the Normandy early Joseon. As you can tell, that's clearly relevant to this painting. Basically, it's what worshippers thought they would see immediately after they died. When they died, Amitabha and the Bodhisattvas would come down from heaven and guide them back up to the Western paradise. That basically explains this painting, the idea behind this painting, the theology behind it. <coughs> However, there's more. Having covered the background as far as possible within my time limit, I'm now going to turn to my main subject, the Louis Saw mural itself. It hangs in Louis Saw's Goodnight John, which translates again as Hall of Ultimate Bliss, Paradise Hall, or Amitabha Hall, because he's the deity to which it's devoted. The Goodnight John in any temple is a replication of the Western Paradise and an inspired meditation on that place and its ruling. Therefore, it's natural that this mural is in Louis Saw's Gunnar John, of which here are my photos. There's a smartphone photos. Here's the Gunnar John at Louis Saw. It is itself a national treasure. Yeah, I'm not sure how old it is. I couldn't get a monk to tell me. You have to take your shoes off to go in. You don't go in the front. I want to take my shoes off over on this side. And enters to the side, and the main altar with the Louis mural is through there, but you can't see it because it's dark. It's a wonderful uh, building, a great example of, uh, I think, Joseon architecture. I think it's 18th century, 19th century. It looks about one of the, it's one of the first Joseon buildings. It's, oh, the it? it's before the Indian weather. Oh, is it? It's a Indian weather. Okay, so Indian weather, well, okay, I'm sorry, I know that. About 1480. Uh, 1480. Okay, so it would have gone up about the same time that the painting was uh, commissioned. So that's that's an interesting fact. Thank you for telling me about that, by the way, And if anyone's seen that enough, here's a sort of close up of it. You can see it more clearly. Uh, I'd also like to show you uh, my um, illegal photo uh, that I took. I, of course, knew the photography of the mural would be um, forbidden, and I uh, know enough Korean to know the signs said photography was forbidden, but I snuck a photo anyway, just couldn't resist. It's a little bit blurry because I took it hurriedly in case a monk came by. Uh, the main point of it is, first of all, you can see the matching statues with uh, Amitabha in the center, and uh, Guanam and uh, Jijang uh, flanking him, and you can see the mural behind it, you can see it's quite large, and you can see it's above the altar, it's a byakwa, it's called a byakwa or altar mural, it hangs behind the altar. It's clearly meant for some of their cushions there, and people can kneel at the altar and look up at the uh, uh, mural and, and contemplate it, uh, pray to it, that's clearly what it's uh, intended for. Okay, uh, moving back to painting itself. There's another reason why this mural hangs at Movie Saw, indeed why it exists in the first place. There's no information about this aspect in English, but I am informed by Professor Kim Jong Hee, an authority on Korean Buddhist art at Wangwan University, that despite the general repression of Buddhism by the Neo-Confucian Joseon rulers, some Buddhist ceremonies were encouraged, and there are other scholars who argue this as well, 
in English, but specifically the information that I have from Professor Kim Jong-hee is that one of these ceremonies is called the Suryu, or water and land ritual, which was performed for the dead so that their souls could continue to paradise. The Suryu was performed at designated regional temples. There was one in each region, and Mui Sa was one of them. Apparently, it was the one for the Southwest. This explains why the mural would have been commissioned from a monk master painter like Haleon, and because it would have uh, aided both the performance of the Suryok, Suryok ceremony with an updated version of the Goryok style, Amitabha welcoming the friend, <coughs> and it would have also served for private contemplation or prayer by worshippers who want to see Amitabha himself and his bodhisattvas after they die. Now that we understand what this mural is for and the tradition that it came out of, uh, I'd like to, uh, oh, wait a minute, I've gotten ahead of myself. We don't have the, the slide for this, so we'll skip this uh, paragraph. And it's worth pointing out that uh, Byakwa, like this, appear to have existed in temples prior to Im Jin Wei Ron, according to Professor Kim Jong Hee, but they were all burned down. There are, however, records making references to them. So, there was a tradition for Abhyakpa uh, welcoming to say um, that uh, they're, they're already the exit from the four MG Wayrun. From, I mean, but from, from the Goryeo, from the Goryeo. Okay. Now I want to pay attention to the, uh, analyze the, the mural itself, my own observations about it. To begin, the halos in the movie style mural are black with Am Amitabha's uh, being pointed upwards. It fits with the, the halo around his body, which, as you can see, is elaborately ornamented, it, uh, rather more so than in the Gorya dynasty triads, where there's just an opaque disc or a goldish halo around the head and body. He sits in Gorya fashion on his lotus throne, with the soles of his feet up, royal fashion, hands in suin position, uh, which represents one of the nine stages of rebirth. You can see his hands are held in symbolic position. That's all Goryeo. Also, like the Goryeo, he wears a red robe, but it doesn't have a gold leaf medallion pattern. I would suspect that that's because of the withdrawal of noble patronage during the Josar. Uh, that maybe they couldn't afford gold leaf to decorate. Uh, Amitabha's red robe. It's sort of a whitish color. On the other hand, maybe it was originally gold leaf, but it's faded. I don't know enough about the, the uh, mural to know. No. Yeah. These whitish, whitish medallions, whatever they were originally, are not distorted by the folds of the cloth. Moreover, even though they're depicted, you, if you look close, you can see some folds of cloth depicted with black streaks. The, Medallions are not so distorted as they are naturalistically in Goryeo painting. Okay. Amitabha stares very directly at the worshiper, seeming to invite interaction, personal contact. <coughs> For their part, the bodhisattvas stand barefoot on ye yellowish lotus uh, foot supports, which is the case you see those at the bottom. Uh, I don't know if you can see them clearly, but they're standing on lotuses uh, like they are in Goryeo paintings. However, both have transparent orange-yellow body halos outlined in black. Uh, they stand on a petrol green tiled floor, which is unusual. I haven't seen that in any Goryeo painting. And the edges of Amitabha's throne are visible in white uh, through their uh, body halos, as you can see. Here and here. Again, I don't know of any Goryeo precedent for that. That's a genocide innovation, as far as I know. Moving behind the uh, main figures to mid ground, we can see uh, minutely detailed clouds with puffy swirling patterns that are also orange yellow, like the overall color scheme of the mural. The heads and shoulders of six of Buddha's disciples 
are projecting out of the clouds with their hands clasped in supplication or prayer. I don't know if you can see their hands clearly from where you're sitting. I can barely see where I'm standing, but hands there, uh, clasped, apparently in praying or supplication. All are balding, and they look to the left or right, not at the worshiper. They're in three quarters profile. You notice that on the left, the two outer ones are facing right, and the middle one is facing left, whereas on the right, the two outer ones are facing left, and the middle one is facing right. Now, I don't know whether that's symbolism, or whether that's for symmetry, or whether that's to add some kind of decoration to the painting, but it's an interesting feature that you don't see anywhere in the Gorya, an example that I've seen anyway. All disciples have serious but calm and reassuring faces. They wear, they all wear robes with patterned lapels except for the one right center. And again, I haven't seen any uh, Gorya or even Joseon painting, and I've looked, that has this kind of feature in it. It's as though the uh, Disciples are coming midway down, uh, supporting the three frontal figures, forming a bridge perhaps between them and the upper background. Okay, but uh, moving back to the center, above Amitabha's head, the intricate clouds touch the top of the mural, which isn't quite visible. The top of this isn't quite visible in this stuff. Uh, and this screen, the screen kind of cuts it off, and it's there. Okay, to the upper left and right is a black ground with uh, what appear to be a star. It looked like heaven with stars in it, or maybe a floral pattern. I haven't been able to tell yet, but I think it's heaven with stars. And then okay, the upper left and right corners, you can see, are two tiny Buddha-like figures floating on clouds. You see those in the upper left and right? Okay. Perhaps they might represent the souls of dead believers who have gone on to Buddhahood in the Western Paradise, which a worshiper contemplating the mural would hope to become him or herself. Okay, perhaps they're Buddhas, perhaps they're something else, but I think they're uh, souls of departed uh, people who have gone on to the Western Paradise and achieved enlightenment there. Along the very top of the mural, at the level of the tiny Buddhas, is a band of more loose but still swirling uh, light orange, yellow, greenish clouds. Okay, uh, upper left and right. See, in the top center, they meet, intertwine, and hang down into Buddha's halo. I think this symbolizes his oneness with the Western paradise or how it emanates from him. And uh, so that pretty much that finishes basically my observations about this. Painting. If we could have seen some slides of the Goryeo ones, there'd be much more ground for comparison because you can see what they look like, although I suppose most of you have seen some Goryeo paintings at one time or another. Uh, when you've been in Korea, I assume you've been in a few Korean museums. Okay. All my observations, though, lead to the main distinction of the movie, movie Saw Mural. It has depth perception, and this depth clearly depicts the triad coming down from paradise to guide a departed soul back up there. This uh, is the major difference uh, with the relatively deathless backgrounds of the Goryeo paintings and makes the movie saw mural more dramatic in my opinion, even if its quality and execution is not quite as high as far as we can see now. Really, this mural might be considered the culmination of the Goryeo tradition, even if it does break the hierarchy <coughs> of putting the body of his head at a higher level than before. That said, there is a Goryeo precedent for this in the Aikendo Amitabha Triad now in Japan, although it depicts uh, Amitabha standing. As far as I can tell, the movie saw mural is the first in which the body of his head are so high uh, beside a seated Amitabha, and the even mark the beginning of the Joseon tradition, since in the National Museum of uh, Korea, there is an 18th century Sakyamuni Buddha triad that has the uh, Bodhisattva's heads level with Sakyamunis. 
It seems as though the Bodhisattva's head came up uh, in the Joseon uh, dynasty. The welcoming descent genre died out during the Joseon, but a similar genre came to replace it, and it still exists today. It's called the Sweet Dew or Nectar Painting, Gando Do in Korean. Okay. According to one source, the name refers to Buddhist teaching, teachings following on believers like Sweet Dew. These paintings are unique to Korea and condense what would have been depicted on various altars in Tang Dynasty China. You know, I don't have an image of a, of a Gando Do, unfortunately, but I'll describe one to you. The upper portion shows Amitabha with heavenly attendants appearing to souls in purgatory or hell and bodhisattvas escorting them to the pure land. In the center of a Gamnodo are Agui or hungry ghosts. They have big bellies and small mouths and throats. They are the souls of people who die without memorial rites. And then Surrounding the center and filling the bottom of a Gando Do are detailed scenes of life on earth and in hell. There are scenes of people going about everyday life, such as uh, uh, working, farming, and there are scenes of people being tormented in hell in a Gando Do. The purpose of a Gando Do is to feed the hungry ghosts and help them rest in peace in heaven. It's a rite that still performed today. I have a couple of pictures, including one I take myself, a contemporary one, but that's not here tonight. The uh, National Museum of Korea art historian uh, Kim Sung-hee does not say so directly, but she makes a point indicating a link between the movie saw mural and today's Gando Do, <coughs> which have bodhisattvas such as Siddhi Garba and Avalokitesvara in the upper part, usually the upper right hand corner. She says, quote, the Buddhist deities are surrounded by clouds stretching away into the sky, suggesting they are descending from the pure land, end quote, <coughs> thus connecting heaven, earth, and hell. Well, that's precisely the cosmic schema that's prefigured in the movie saw mural, as we can see here, fortunately I have this image. Okay. Kim Sung Hee further points out that Gando Do were used in rituals to lead the dead to the paradise, such as the Suryo, okay, which was what this painting was created for. Gando, she claims, means nectar, which is the food of paradise that enables hungry ghosts to enter it. Whether you think Gando Do means sweet dew painting or nectar painting, it's clearly a continuation of the main concern of the welcoming descent genre seen here namely enabling souls to enter the Western paradise. In conclusion, I want to return to the Gorya practice of inscribing Amitabha paintings with the phrase, for these merits, I hope myself and others to be reborn in paradise. Significantly, this continued until the end of the Joseon, despite all its repression of Buddhism. Therefore, Amitabha's cult must have had a perpetual attraction to Koreans, coupled with the belief that invoking Amitabha's name on one's deathbed, especially while regarding an image of him, ensured rebirth of the Western paradise, we have a clear theological foundation for the movie we saw mural. We can understand why it's there and what it was for. It would have served as a prop for the Suryu and similar death rites, as well as an object of contemplation and prayer by believers who hope to achieve salvation by meditating on it. As such, it must have been a source of comfort to many down the centuries, and it may even still be today. People still kneel and pray to it, and I suppose there are still people in Korea who look at it and think that's what they'll see after they die. Amitabha and the two bodhisattvas coming for to carry me home. As an artifact, uh, in fact, one does not have to be a Buddhist to draw inspiration from it because of the meaning uh, 
uh, that it has, which I've tried to make clear in this lecture. As an artifact, it represents the transition between two periods of Korean history, from the state religion to a repressed religion, it still went on in an underground way. But more than that, it's a haunting masterpiece of world religious art. Thank you. Questions? Well, I have. I have. Yeah. yeah. When, when did the European uh, uh, get first interest in the Buddhist uh, art? I, I suppose the, well, the first Europeans to come to Korea were were French Jesuits, and they studied uh, Confucianism and Buddhist classics. So I suppose they must have had some interest in it. Um, I'm not. I'm not aware. You're asking me when I first became interested. Yeah. You're asking when European. In European. It is, um, well, I know that by the late 18th century, there were encyclopedias coming out in Europe with descriptions of origin, Oriental religions. I saw one, in fact, the Bibliothèque Nationale. But I suppose it really would have been in the uh, uh, early mid 19th century when the Royal Asiatic Society was founded. It was founded, I think, in the eight, around 1840, 1830, 1840. So around the second quarter, second quarter of the 19th century was when Europeans began to be interested in Buddhism. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And later, later in the 19th century, in the 1870s, there was a book series called Non-Western Religions, which explained uh, Buddhism and Taoism and Hinduism to English people. I've seen a copy of it in the uh, British Library. So I've actually seen 18th and 19th century European books discussing Oriental religion, so I guess early 19th century. Uh, uh, back there, I think I saw you first. Um, your description of the use of the painting as a kind as a, a ritualistic aid yeah. Um, brought to my mind uh, uh, Robert Thurman's description of Tibetan pankas as a kind of psycho spiritual technology. Um, in, in very much the same way, it was designed as something that uh, a believer could focus on for the purpose of manipulating their own psychology, their own thought process. It's part of the meditative process. Um, what, what I'm wondering is what. Uh, what, what contemporaneous evidence we have for the use of these paintings for that purpose that supports the inference that that's what they were used for? Well, I'm unfamiliar with uh, Tibetan Tonkas, although I was having dinner before with uh, Mr. Chong and Brother Anthony. I think Brother Anthony mentioned Tibetan uh, Tonkas as a kind of parallel to this. Um, as far as I know, that's what the scholarship indicates, but I think that that's what uh, the most logical conclusion will reach from, from, from looking at it. Uh, it's, it's part of a ceremonial, it's a ceremonial aid and also an aid to contemplation. My main authority for that is uh, Michael uh, Shin, whose articles are available on JSTOR if you, if you search um, Amitabha Buddha Triads on, on that, that website. Um, I, I agree with him. His main, his main argument uh, that that has been for. I can't think of anything else for which a painting that looks like that would be for than, than uh, looking at meditating on since, since it's fully frontal. I mean, that's, that's the main point. That, uh, there's a strong psychological impact from the frontal nature of the imagery. Somewhat related to that, uh, what do we know in terms of contemporaneous evidence for who the consumer of Okay. Well, uh, I think that you'd have had uh, a lot of common people going to the temple because in the early Joseon, uh, aristocratic uh, patronage went more on the Ming Chinese Confucian model. You have less visits to monasteries from the upper classes, more visits from maybe middle and peasant classes. That would be my guess. Uh, Temples were in fact open to to all 
And that's why I say at the end, this, this painting would have given comfort to a lot of people down through the centuries because it, it, was, uh, it was accessible to whoever went there, whoever went there. So I suppose it would be, it would be commoners and middle classes with some, some aristocratic worship continuing. Good question. Yeah, and this gentleman over here has his hand up. Joe, you have a question? Yes, I, I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, uh, another function of these paintings would be uh, not only to uh, remember Amitabha on uh, 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 the moment of death, but also to uh, to uh, be visited by these uh, bodhisattvas in the Buddha in, the, in, the, in their dreams, yeah. in the dream life. And I think it would have occurred in the dream life. Also, very common, there were dream journals at the time. Uh, even by Japanese monks who were traveling with the army, uh, they kept, and also in Japan, they, and many of the dreams had to do with visions of the uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattva. Yeah. Uh, the other other comment, I, I wish, could you turn the light off one more time to make it more clear? It's uh, no, no, uh, this one. The pillow. Yeah. No, 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 it's strange. There's two things that are strange here. One is this, uh, is this looks like a dragon, but I guess it's part of the garment. It's yeah, part of the garment, some kind of ribbon coming off. But, its but this one looks like a fox or, or some kind of animal, but not a dragon. What is that? Is that just a garment too? Or just I think it's a decoration on the garment. I don't remember noticing any kind yeah. of garment. This, this, this is not as good as it is in the... In, uh, to see it in real life is best. And then there's a book called An Encounter with the Beauty of Korean Buddhism, which uh, published in 2012. Uh, you can get it in any temple, major temple bookstore. Um, and I think it's probably available on Amazon. It has a little section on this. Actually, it was that book which was presented to me by an English speaking abbot in Busan yes. that got me interested in this painting in the first place and led me to make a pilgrimage uh, out to uh, Dangjingun. Um, about a year ago, and, and behold it for myself. Um, yeah. that, that, that's an interesting point. And uh, uh, Michael Shin does in fact make references to visions of, dream visions of uh, welcoming descents by believers as a result of meditating a long time on these paintings. I didn't include it in my lecture because of the time limit, but people did in fact have visions of this in their sleep as a result of meditating on it for long periods. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, because Bodhisattva is very famous for its very complete set of views. Uh, most of them were taken off the walls and, uh, because uh, they're in the museum there next to it. I forget when they were taken off. Was it Japanese period or? 1960, maybe 1960s, and um, they were then, I think most of them have been replaced in the temple by copies, but there's a, there's a very fine collection of murals and fragments of murals in the museum there on the side there. Um, you didn't mention what's at the back. Um, this is the site facing out. Uh, but if you go around the back, there's this fantastic um, contemporary, uh, uh, 14th century, 15th uh, century, uh, full scale, large uh, uh, mural of um, um, exploring. I thought I wasn't supposed to go back there, so I didn't. Next time, I mean, hey, they, they don't even this one. They go back. I didn't notice any of the other people in there doing that. Well, they don't, didn't notice that. They didn't go with the RAS. They didn't go with the RAS. They didn't go with the It's in my home base. My camera happened to take a photo by accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful thing. It's very, very delicate, very, very delicate. Um, yeah, you seem to have a good 
it's uh, it's very close. And on much of the uh, the other mills, so they're very very early close on and obviously sort of uh, artifact or influence by the Royal Iconography. Okay, the gentleman behind here was uh, Tom. 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 T
couldn't recount off the top of my head for placing, uh, for agreeing with the 1476 more or less date because of uh, the way it appears compared to its its uh, Goryeo predecessors. And I think there's some probably some historical record saying it's uh, uh, was painted around that time. At least legally, historians are historians to figure it was painted uh, around the 1470s for the historical record. Uh, again, the book Encounter with the Beauty of Korean Buddhism might have a note on that. I don't remember offhand. The Encounter with the Beauty of Korean Buddhism is, uh, is a great book with a lot of footnotes in it, a lot of documentation in it. So that, that's all I can tell you. Okay. Thank you very much.